49 and each psalm has a title unfortunately these titles are not written in Coptic reader but you can find it in the Bible itself so the title of this psalm is to the chief musician a son of the son of Korah who are the son of Korah uh, they were Levites from the family of Kohat. And during David's time, the son of Korah served in the musical aspect of the temple. As we read in Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 19. So the occasion of this psalm is not known. Uh, the previous psalm 48 included a call to all people to recognize God, the ruler of the world, through his mighty deeds for Israel and through seeing the holy city of God, Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is a symbol of the church. In this psalm also, there is a call for all the people, but for a different reason, with a subject of common interest to all humanity. What this subject? This psalm is a reflective or meditative psalm. It is full of lessons of wisdom. And the subject is the vanity of trusting in the riches or trusting in the earthly goods which cannot save or prolong life or cannot actually redeem the person and grant you the eternal life. The style of this psalm, more or less like the book of Job. It is also a meditation on the usual pride of those who trust in riches. And the psalmist solution of this problem is to point out and to explain the limits of the power of wealth the power of wealth actually is limited in a way it is useless. All the wealth in the world cannot purchase exemption from death or can not redeem you for eternal life. This psalm is a short psalm, only 20 verses. And we can divide it into three sections. The first section, a fervent invitation to listen. The psalmist asking people to pay attention and to listen. From 5 to 12, unreliable wealth and the limited honor of those who trust in riches. And from 13 to 20, he's making a contrast between the ungodly and the righteous. So let's start from verse 1. Hear this, all peoples. Give ear all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. So he wants everyone to listen. Everyone. So this psalm begins more like a proverb than a song. All peoples, all the inhabitants of the world are called to listen. For the subject is of common interest. It concerns all humanity. What he's about to say is worthy of everyone's attention and it pertains equally to all mankind. 
he says, give ear. Don't just listen out of curiosity, but give ear, understand, and learn. And the first verse, it's like the opening words of Micah prophecy, and also the word of uh, Micaiah in First King 22, verse 28. And here the psalmist spoke to everyone, rich, poor, together, all the inhabitants of the earth. He hoped to guide those who were troubled about the wealth of the wicked. Usually, it's a question mentioned several times in the Bible. Why the wicked are in prosperity? So he wants actually to guide those who were troubled when they see the wealth and prosperity of the wicked. Also, the psalm carries a warning to the great and rich. But when I say the rich here, I mean those who trust the riches. Also, there is a consolation to the poor and the lowly. According to Ensimus, Bishop of Jerusalem, who quotes many fathers, and in particular, scholar Origen and St. Basil the Great, the psalmist mentioned three categories of people. He said all peoples, all inhabitants of the world, rich and poor men. And according to Onesimus, Bishop of Jerusalem, he said, all people means the non-believers. As the Lord Jesus Christ came as a, physician, uh, as a divine physician to heal the ill. He came actually to all the people, to non-believers, to heal them and to call them to believe in him. And he said, the inhabitant of the world, he means the righteous. Because these are the true inhabitant of the world. But also even those are in need of divine counsel and wisdom. And rich and poor, he means the earthly men, people who are lovers of earth rich and poor together. They are called upon to pay attention and to listen to what he is about to say. So the rich may not be delighted in and to trust in their riches. And the poor may not be unhappy or sad because of their poverty. So there is a message here for the rich and the poor. So it is time for all people to receive the word of, of the Lord. For the non-believers to receive faith. For the fallen to receive repentance. And for those who strive in righteousness of Christ to continue in their struggle and spiritual work. Then in verse 3 he says, My mouth shall speak wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall give understanding. My mouth shall speak wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall give understanding. Here, when he asked them to listen to him, he knows that he is inspired. So the psalmist is not praising his own wisdom, as we will see in verse 4. But he is praising the divine spirit which he spoke in him. He knew that the spirit of truth and wisdom is speaking through him. That's why the people need to listen to this psalm to obtain wisdom, which is this wisdom is better than the wealth of the world which they desire. 
These words of wisdom are for all the inhabitants of the world. And this teaching is a result of thought and reflection. He said, the meditation of my heart. So the mouth speaks what the heart meditates. And if the heart meditates on understanding, then the mouth will speak of wisdom. St. Augustine is saying why he repeated, my mouth shall speak wisdom, and then he repeated, and the meditation of my heart shall give understanding. So St. Augustine said this repetition is made lest uh, by chance if he had said only my mouth, you should suppose that he is speaking according to understanding of his lips. For many have understanding in their lips, but have not in their heart. As the scripture says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts is far from me. So when he said, my mouth shall speak of wisdom, in order that you might know that what is poured from his mouth flows from his heart, he added, the meditation of my heart of understanding. Then why I told you these words are words of divine wisdom? Because in verse 4 he said, I will incline my ear to a proverb. So the psalmist himself will listen to the Holy Spirit and will incline his ear. I will disclose my dark saying on the heart. St. John Chrysostom is wondering, what is the connection of verse 4, I will incline my ear to a proverb, I will disclose my dark saying on the harp, with the previous verse? He answered, the teacher is now a listener. I will incline my ear. He is learning with the rest of the people. So the psalmist did not want to those who listen to his word think that this wisdom is his wisdom. St. John Chrysostom continues and says, he shows through the following remarks that the words are divine and far from uttering anything personal. What he says is what he heard from God. So the psalmist receives by revelation what he desires to teach. He will incline his ear to the voice of God before he attempts to speak to men. And this actually is a lesson to all of us, either clergy or Sunday school servants. We need to listen to God before we speak to people. So we don't preach our own message, but we preach the message that God wants to deliver to the people. That's why the psalmist also shall join with the rest of the world in attending to this message. So while it seems that he is teaching them, he himself also is learning the same lesson. But what did he mean when he said, I will disclose my dark saying on the heart? Because what he is about to say and they are about to hear is difficult and hard to understand. As St. Paul said, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then in the eternal life, face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. So the psalmist hoped that doing it on the harp, like with music 
and chanting, this might help the message to be better remembered. Usually we remember the songs when we repeat it. That's why by chanting it on a harp, he wants this message to be remembered. Verse 5. He said, Why should I fear in the days of evil? when the iniquity at my heels surround me? So that is a question he wants to answer. Why should I fear in the days of evil when the iniquity at my heels surround me? At my heels uh, remind me was what the Lord said to Adam. The serpent will crush the heel of is a human being. So why should I fear? The people of God look calmly forward to dark times when those evil wanted to trip up their heels and gain a temporary advantage over them. When they see the wicked men are flourishing, and good men are oppressed and persecuted. The psalmist used a language to describe his enemies that's actually similar to Psalm 41, verse 9. Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. And according to origin, scholar origin, the iniquity of heel is the disobedience of Adam that caused the serpent to have authority to crush his heel. So he might be speaking about the oppression by the wicked or fears of sin. When iniquity of all sorts abound, that turns the good day into day of evil. When the person is tempted with sin, tempted very severely to fall into a sin. Because sin, in many respects, is grievous and distressing to good man. As we read in Romans chapter 2, verse 5, but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So this is the wisdom and understanding of psalmist had been meditating upon and was about to utter. This is actually the parable he inclined his ear to when he said, I incline my ear. And the dark saying he would open that the righteous has nothing to fear in the worst of time. So maybe the righteous people will face persecution, will face dark moments in their life. The wicked may oppress them. The wicked may persecute them. But they should not fear. Why they should not fear? Because in verse 6, he said, those who trust in their wealth, and most commonly, these are the people who actually oppress and persecute the righteous. Those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches. So, Having said that good men had no sufficient reason to fear on account of what they might suffer from ungodly men, although in spite of this suffering, but we should not be fearful, now in verse 6, explain that the ungodly had no reason to be secure in their riches. It is not merely the position of riches that make one ungodly. 
but those who trust in wealth and boast in their riches. And when you study the scripture, you will find several godly rich men, such as Abraham and King David, who trusted in God and made their boast in him, not in riches uh, and the wealth of the world. So, what if the good man's enemies be among the proud, boastful rich people and the great ones of the earth? The psalmist said, the righteous man must not fear them. But why? And how? Because, yes, maybe in this life they have power to destroy others. Yes, in this life, maybe there is a small value of riches. But the helplessness of the riches will appear at the hour of death. So the psalmist here wants to give us an eternal perspective of the situation. Rich, richness and wealth is powerless. That's why in verse 7 he said, None of them can by any means redeem his brother. Regardless how rich you are, you cannot redeem yourself from eternal death or your brother. Nor give to God a ransom for him. You cannot give God ransom for your sins by money. So the richness and the wealth is useless, helpless when we speak about eternal life. And in verse 8 he says, for the redemption of their souls is costly. Do you want to know how, how costly it is? As St. Peter said, you were redeemed not by silver or gold or precious stone, but the blood of lamb without blemish, the lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Who can afford this? That's why he said, and it shall cease forever. This wealth will cease forever, has, has no power forever. So, the wealth cannot deliver anyone from death. If the rich man has so little to hope, then his victims here on earth has very little to fear. He should not be afraid. As the Lord said, don't be afraid from those who kill the body. Because after that, they have nothing to do. They cannot do anything. They have no power over our soul. Death, actually, all of us will die. Death is the death which we all owe. And which each must pay for himself. But for the righteous people who believed in God, God paid my debts. But if I don't believe in God, the wealth and the richness cannot pay my debt. No wealth can buy a man off. However great this wealth, nor give to God a ransom for this man. Money itself cannot rescue a soul because the redemption of the soul is very costly. It is beyond the ability of material things to purchase. St. John Chrysostom says, he added this, that the redemption of their souls is costly to show that he was right in mentioning one fear to be entertained. This, the only fear that we should entertain, the fear of sin, no other fear. That's why the Lord said, I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who has 
the power after killing the body to throw in hell. That's sin. Fear of sin. So the psalmist here is questioning the value of wealth in preserving life or in redeeming souls, which is more worth than the whole world and in saving man from the grave. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ said, what profit a man if he win or gain the whole world and lost his own soul? The only price of redemption of a soul is the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He paid his life as a ransom, as we read in 1 Timothy 2, 6. So the redemption of the soul is not possible under any other ground, only the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wealth will cease forever. Wealth forever comes short of the power necessary to accomplish this. There is no hope that wealth ever will be sufficient. So the whole matter is perfectly hopeless when it comes to the power of death in saving one human being from grave. Wealth cannot save one human being from grave. The soul has no power to object or to oppose when it hears the divine command, this night your soul will be required of you. Verse 9 that he should continue to live eternally and not see the pit. So verse 9 is a continuation of verse 7. In verse 7 he said, none of them can by any means redeem his brother. So this ungodly, uh, wicked people who trust in their riches cannot redeem their brother or can give to a God a ransom for themselves. They cannot do this that they may continue to live eternally and not see the pit. So verse 9 is a continuation of verse 7. And verse 8 uh, actually is inserted between verses 7 and 9 to describe the effect which payment of a ransom uh, by, by a rich. So there is no effect of paying a ransom by a rich. So the meaning of verse 9 is that those who have the redemption of their souls by the blood of Jesus Christ will live eternally and will not see the pit. But those who want to redeem themselves by their wealth and their riches, they cannot live eternally and they will see the pit. And the concept of pet here is more just than the grief. It is the ultimate destiny of those who reject God. Verse 10, for he sees wise men die. Likewise, the fool and the senseless person perish and leaves their wealth to others. So verse 10, everyone dies, the wise and the foolish. Everyone dies and they will leave their wealth to others. So in verse 10, he explained that all men die, wise and good, as well as foolish and wicked. Every man sees and knows it. The experience show it. The rich man must see that any hope of ransoming himself by means of his wealth and to escape this and the grave is vain. Since the law of death, which is seen to all, is common. And in verse 10, the reference here is especially to the rich, whether they are wise or foolish or senseless. So the simple fact is no matter what may be the character of the men of wealth, whether the rich man is wise or foolish, he must certainly die. His wealth cannot save them from the grave. 
the wealthy person himself sees this. It cannot be concealed from him. And no one can carry his wealth with them. It will be of no service to them after this. That's why they leave their wealth to others. So uh, our material wealth can do us good in this world only, but can help us in the world to come, as the Lord Jesus Christ explained, if we start storing up treasures in heaven by helping the poor and the needy. Uh, verse 11, their inner thought is that their houses will last forever. So the rich people, they believe that their houses will last forever. Their dwelling places to all generations, they will last to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. That's why they call the land or the city after their own names. So, although the inevitability of death is so obvious, but the psalmist wants to give us insight into the mindset of the wealthy people. Again, wealthy means those who trust in riches. Though they know that all will perish, the rich and worldly have an idea, the inner thought, that they can escape this. If they do reflect that they die, they comfort themselves in the illusion that their houses will last forever. So they say, yes, I will die, but my house will last forever. And they convince themselves that they can keep their names by calling their houses or land or cities after their names. So their names will be remained in the names of their palaces, which like builders of cities or conquerors, they name the land or the city after themselves. Verse uh, 12, nevertheless, man, though in honor, does not remain. He is like the beast that perish. So, again, he repeats, in spite of this inner thought of uh, these wicked people and the outward action naming their land after their own names, the psalmist, again, maintain the ground taken before, that all will perish. Though a man may have some measure of honor here on earth through properties, or descendants, or memorials, does not remain just like, he, he will not remain, and he will die just like an animal dies. He who assumed to abide in this world and keep on enjoying its pleasure is foolish and without understanding, and would be counted like the beasts. That's why he said, they, he is like the beast that perishes. Why he compared them to the beasts? Because they are irrational, like wolves, lions, dogs, oxen, serpents. They are irrational. They perish like the beasts, as they are like them in the life, full and ignorant, like the beasts. And in death, they die like the beasts. How? Because they die without any preparation for this, any preparation for eternal life, like beasts. Therefore, the truly wise person does not trust in riches or boast in wealth. That is the true, right, the, the, the wise person. He prepares for eternity by trusting God and making their boast in the Lord. Verse 13, this is the way of those who are foolish and of their posterity who approve their sayings. Selah. So, 
the psalmist noted that the way that values the material over the spiritual and does not prepare for the world to come is foolishness. They are self-confident. And there is also a second foolish way to be a follower or a descendant of one who trusted and boasted in riches and to approve of his uh, world view. That's why he said, this is the way of those who are foolish. Just to trust in your riches and that is the foolishness. And also of their posterity, those, their descendants and those who follow them, who approve their saying, who approve the saying of their uh, uh, parents or leaders. Then he concluded this by Silah. Silah is supposed not of attention to meditate on the vanity of the world. Then in Psalm, in verse 14, he said, like sheep, they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them. The upright shall have dominion over them in the morning. And their beauty, the beauty of the wicked, shall be consumed in the grave far from their dwelling. So from verse 14, he starts to contrast the eternity of the ungodly with the eternity of the godly. In verse 12, he said man is buried like an animal and death consumes his material body. The first death shall consume their bodies in grave, but the second death, which is eternal perdition, shall devour their souls. And because these men have rejected God, the good shepherd, the, the whole life here on earth, they will have their own shepherd. Who will be their own shepherd? The death. That's why it says, death shall feed on them. The al-maut yara'ahum. Death shall feed on them. This will be their own shepherd. The righteous are led by the good shepherd, but the God, God, ungodly have death for their own shepherd. The upright who did not trust or boast in riches. The upright will have dominion over the ungodly, those who lived and died with a focus on material and with no urgency to prepare for eternity. The godly will judge the ungodly in the eternal life. The godly will judge. That's why he said will have dominion over them. And according to St. Basil, man, though in honor that he did not recognize, has been likened to irrational beasts. So maybe you have honor here on earth. But if you trust in the riches, then this person will be like irrational beasts. Hence, the crafty devil took over the entire human race, gathered all men in show like sheep, that's before Christ, helpless and irrational, and pushed them down the death, and kept shepherding them since Adam, up to the coming, the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ, glory be to him, who said in the gospel, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for sheep, which were shepherded by death, and he descended to Hades and took the captivity captive. And when the morning finally comes, those who did not trust or boast in wealth, the upright will be justified. The morning can be the second coming of Christ. When he said, uh, the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning because they will judge the ungodly. Sinners may rule here on earth till night fall, but in the morning, in the second coming of Christ, they will find their position totally reversed. The godly will judge them and rule over them. So for the upright, 
that the morning will bring an eternal day for them, eternal life. And the beauty of the ungodly, or the glory and pleasure that they had in this life, was imaginary. It was not real. It was like a shadow. And now it disappeared. They shall be hurried from their large and pleasant mansions here on earth into close and dark grave. St. Augustine says, For the non-believers, death is a shepherd, whereas for the believers, life is a shepherd. If in Sheol there are the sheep whose shepherd is death, in heaven, on the other hand, there will be the sheep whose shepherd is life. In flesh, we walk on earth, but with the heart, we dwell in heaven. If we send there ahead of us everything that touches us, if we send to heaven, then the fruit of our labor will appear in the morning. Those who labor now will reign in heaven, whereas the proud and the haughty here will go down below in hell. Verse 15. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grief, for he shall receive me, Selah. So the one who trusted and boasted in riches had no power to ransom or redeem a soul, as we read in verses 7 and 8. But the righteous understand that God and God alone had the power to redeem his soul from the power of grief. While wealth is powerless to prevent the death, God can and will deliver his servants. The psalmist expressed his faith that though he should die physical death here on earth and for a while be under the power of the grave until the second coming of Christ, yet he will not be hurt by the second death. We will rise and live eternally with God. He should be redeemed from the death in the resurrection. That's why he said, God will redeem my soul from the power of, of the grave, for he shall receive me, Selah. Power of the grave. The psalm spoke of the grave in which the wicked are left, and here he says that the grave shall not have power to retain the righteous but shall be forced to give the righteous up into the Father's hand in the second coming. And hell shall have no power to get hold of the righteous. As the Lord said, the hour is coming in John chapter 5, when all those who are in the grave will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who have done good, they will be risen into the resurrection of life. And St. Augustine says, he is speaking of this redemption, which Christ now shows in himself through the resurrection, for he has descended into hell, or Hades, and has ascended into heaven. How great is such a hope to anything which the ungodly can boast. So compare this hope with the hope of the ungodly, there is no comparison. And again, Silah, because this is something worthy of meditation. Verse 16, do not be afraid when one becomes rich, when the glory of his house is increased. So if you see the wicked became more powerful, more wealthy, and his glory is increasing, don't be afraid. Why? For when he dies, he shall carry nothing away. He cannot take anything of his worth with him. His glory shall not descend after him. His glory cannot go down with him to hell. So again, the psalmist is repeats and confirm the general lessons of the psalm. So this is like a conclusion. So after he expressed his own hope of escaping from death or being rescued from corruption, the psalmist repeating the question of verse 5 and complete the answer here. 
you should not be afraid. There is no ground of fear, nor even for perplexity when the wicked grow rich and prosper because they will die. And dying cannot take anything of their position with them and will have no advantage from it after they die. On the contrary, their misery in eternity will be such as to far outweigh any enjoyment which they may have had on earth. So the misery in hell will actually, yeah, is not comparable to any enjoyment they had on earth. So the so psalmist assures us that reason of fear are not founded. You should not be afraid. You should not worry. The fool who trusted and boasted in riches can take nothing with them into the world beyond the death. Temporary prosperity is a matter too small to be worthy of worry. It's nothing. You should not worry or be afraid. His glory shall not descend after him. Whatever glory they have here on earth and their wealth here will not secure to him eternal life. Uh, and everything they will leave it here behind them. But for the upright, the opposite is true. Their glory shall ascend after them, and they will, in some sense, be brought to glory, and even they will obtain the glory of God in the world to come. Verse 18, Though while the ungodly lives, he blesses himself, he glorifies himself. For men also will praise you when you do well for yourself. He shall go to the generation of his father. They will die. But what will happen? They shall never see light. A man who is in honor, yet does not understand, is like the beasts that perish. So, those who trust and boast in their riches are often pleased with themselves and others are pleased with them. So they bless themselves, they glorify themselves. But this is short-lived. Each will die and go to the generation of his fathers. Yes, they may bless themselves. They may proclaim themselves happy men because of their wealth and riches and perhaps foolishly praise himself with peace, prosperity, and length of days, even with honor and glory after death. However, much the wicked man delight in his life, nevertheless he has to die, and to join the generation of his father, and to go where they have gone before him. That's what he said, he shall go to the generation of his father, he shall never see light. St. Augustine, comments on verse 18 and says, because he ate and drank, because he did what he chose, because he feasted lavishly, therefore he did well with himself. Then he said, I say he did ill for himself. Nor I say, but Christ, he did ill for himself. Why? For that rich man, when he feasted lavishly every day, was supposed to do well with himself. But when he began to burn in hell, then that which was supposed to be well was found to be ill. The psalmist may have had a dim understanding of punishment in the world to come, but he knew, knew it to be, in some sense, place of darkness. God will redeem the soul of the righteous from the power of death, but the rich, ungodly man shall forevermore not see the light, as we read in verse 19. And the psalm ends in verse 20 by repeating warning first given in verse 12. They will be like beasts. It's a crucial warning to those who may have honor in this world but have no understanding. Their honor in this world will not preserve them in the next life. 
all men die. But only those who are without understanding die without hope. And if men do not understand the difference between men and animals and do not follow the highest wisdom and be like beasts, find their all in their life, then their end shall be as that of beasts. That's why St. Augustine says, but you brethren, consider that you be men made after the image and likeness of God. The image of God is within, is made wherein is the intellect, wherein is the mind, wherein the power of discovering truth, wherein is faith, wherein is your hope, wherein your charity. There God has his image. There at least you perceive and see that these things pass away. The, etern the, the material thing. Be not disquieted. For of whatsoever kind these things be, they are transitory. So all these material things are just transient. If you are men who being in honor understand, for if being men in honor Yet you understand not, yet you don't understand. You are compared to the beasts without sense and made like them. This actually concludes Psalm 49 uh, from the Psalms of David. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.